So good to get to be involved with a church that loves to love people with the love of God. And uh, thank you so much, Krista, for sharing. Uh, my name is Travis, the lead pastor here at Antioch. So thankful that you are here and uh, that we get to be in the presence of God together, uh, that we get to, to live out life together. I want to share one thing before uh, we get going, and uh, it's about World Mandate, which unbelievably is coming up in two weeks, uh, which is exciting for many people in the room. I know many people have already signed up. Uh, it's a little terrifying for some of the staff putting it on, like, oh my gosh, we only have two weeks to get everything wrapped up and ready to go. Uh, but uh, this week, every year, is a very significant week in the life of this church body and family. Uh, I, I was thinking about it like this. So every week we have life groups. We uh, gather together on a Sunday to meet together corporately and worship. We have discipleship, relationship, different community groups that are getting together, all which are very significant uh, for, for the daily walk that we're called to, to live out in Christ, where uh, we're walking together in community, where we're getting in the word together, where there's, uh, there's fellowship and all of those types of things that help us to live out Monday morning uh, and Friday night and all all of everything in between uh, the, the life that's called, that we're called to live in the gospel. And so it's powerful and significant. There are also times, I believe, and that's what World Mandate is, is times uh, where we step back and kind of get up above all of the daily grind. Uh, and so for this a, a kind of a, a lofty word, but I, I believe world mandates like a weekend of transcendence where we're, we're coming up and out of that which is the, the normal every day and walking together and living out the, the things of the kingdom to say, okay, God, what, what are you doing? What are your purposes? What does it look like for me to live those things out? And what is the, the fresh call that you have for my life? And, and we want to tune into those things. It's kind of getting above the clouds in that way. And so it, it's a weekend for us to, to do just that. And, and so w as we think about this weekend every year, we begin by just saying, God, what do you have for us? What is the, the kind of big thing that you're wanting to, to do? And, and we, we pray about a theme. Like, what is, the, what is the, the overarching theme of what you're wanting to do? And this, way, this year, uh, the theme that he spoke was make way, that we would make way, that we would be a people that make a way for Jesus. That we would make a way for God to have his way and uh, that we would go before him and that he might be exalted and people might see him. And so with the theme, we begin to think about speakers, communicators who have a, a kind of a transcendent message that we feel like would speak to us and take us to the place that God would want to lead us. And so this year we have Jimmy Seibert coming in, who's been with us the last few years, the leader of the Antioch movement, uh, that, that really for, for all of us in the way that he leads and lays down his life, uh, makes a way for us uh, as a movement to, to step into the things that God has for us. And so we're excited about the word that, that God will bring to us through him as, as one of a, as a father, as a a, as a friend and, uh, and as the, many of you have gotten to know him over the years. Also, uh, we've got Michael Miller coming in uh, to town who is the, the leader and founder of Upper Room. Many of you have been blessed through their worship music and uh, he's the, the man that kind of had the vision that God gave to see uh, a place established like the Upper Room where people could, could linger with God, uh, with, with, with Jesus and be, be in, in his presence and uh, to seek his face. And so we're excited about having him uh, come and to share with us about what does it look like to make a way uh, for, for Jesus uh, to to, to be with us in, in that way. And uh, we also have a, a woman who you're gonna be incredibly blessed by, uh, who's got a, a ministry in, in Africa, but has been all over, all over the world to sharing the, the, the life and love of Christ. And when, when you hear her speak, she's kind of one of those when you begin to hear some of her, her stories and the things that, that God's used her to do, you're kind of like, am I even a Christian? Like the way she lives her life and pours herself out and sacrifices and surrenders you're like okay that's what it's supposed to look like but no but, but really uh, we're, we're excited to hear from these men and women and uh, it, because I believe it's going to take us to a place of just seeing God for who he is and allowing him the space uh, to speak to us uh, what we're what we're called to do and who we're called to be in a fresh way so if this is your church family I want to encourage you if you haven't already to sign up uh, there may be others that, that you know of that want to be a part of something like that we invite you to 
to welcome them as well. But what I'd like to do is just take a moment to pray uh, because this is a conference that, that our church puts on as a, as, a, as a rallying point. I just want to invite you to pray with me into that, not only for what's going to be happening here in this room, but also... As you may know, our kids have a, a concurrent conference that's going on where we're believing the same things uh, for them. And uh, so join with me in praying for them. And as we pray, just pray the things that you would want to believe for yourself or that you are believing for yourself as you come to the conference, places of breakthrough, that place of fresh calling in God. Uh, but let's just take a moment as it's coming up in just a couple of weeks to really pray uh, for all that God wants to do. So Lord Jesus, we're, we're so thankful for this church body. We're thankful for the community that, that we, we're able to walk with day in and day out, the place of encouragement, the place of challenge, the place of corporate worship and discipleship and community. Lord, we need that every day uh, to walk out our faith. We also thank you for moments like World Mandate where we're able to step back and have a more transcendent moment to just kind of see above all the noise and the clouds and the commotion to see you for who you are, to hear you clearly, to get fresh perspective, to hear your vision and a fresh sense of calling uh, that's, that's deep within your heart for each one of us. And so Lord, we're praying that it would be a significant catalytic moment for our church, that there would be a, a great deal of synergy for us to just come around the purposes of God as a people and as a church, as families. And Lord, that you would be glorified as a result. Lord, I pray for our kids that, uh, that they would have an, an incredible experience with you, uh, one that they would never forget, uh, one that would shape them and mark them in their, their faith and their life in God. And uh, Lord Jesus, we just pray over uh, every, every uh, schedule that it would, that their, that their scheduling conflicts, that they would be cleared up. If we're feeling tired and having a, a capacity lack, Lord, that you would just fill us up, that you would make a way for each and every one of us to be there um, as you speak to us and lead us as a church community. We love you. We love you, Jesus, because you first loved us. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, again, thanks for, for being here today. We're going to jump back into our series on Daniel, uh, where we are looking at uh, being a, a believer in a broken world. The series is called Believers in Babylon. We're recognizing uh, really in, in an incredible way the similarities between our life lived out here as, as believers in a plural, an increasingly pluralistic society. Society, as, and similar to that of Daniel living out his faith in God in, in, a, in a pagan Babylon and just the way that he navigated the challenges in the culture, how uh, he walked with God uh, in, in the midst of, of, of trials, in the, in the midst of different leadership uh, and was able to see God move in, in a significant way in and through his life and in and through the culture that he lived in. And so we're in Daniel 6 this week and I um, want to invite you uh, to turn there in your Bibles with me. We're going to be reading through this passage of scripture beginning in Daniel 6 verse 1 and I want to go ahead and uh, get through verse 10 and then we'll pause for a minute to talk about what we're reading. So Daniel 6, beginning in verse 1, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. And the royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. 
Now your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. And so we pick up in the life of Daniel here in Daniel chapter six with a new ruler. It is King Darius of the Medes. It's the third ruler that we've been introduced to since we've begun our study in Daniel. Last week, we had the short reign of Belshazzar, uh, who was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar ultimately repented to God, humbled himself before God through the witness of Daniel as well as others. Uh, Belshazzar did not learn the lessons of his father, acted in great arrogance and worship the God of gold and silver and God quickly ended his reign. And now we have the reign of King Darius that has begun and he's begun to set up uh, his, his rule, his governance uh, through appointing satraps uh, to help to govern the land and then three administrators that would be over all of the satraps of whom Daniel was one. So Daniel immediately upon the reign of this king finds himself back at the top of governance, quickly finding favor so much so that the king uh, plans to put him in charge of the whole land. If he didn't already have enough influence at the top there, he's gonna be put over the entire land. Uh, so he has quickly found favor in the eyes of Darius. It says it this way in verse three. Daniel so distinguished himself, even among the other administrators, whom there was only three, and the satraps, by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to put him in charge of the whole kingdom, all right? And, and so I want us to take a moment uh, to think about what, what's happening here. And, and really to look at the, the word that's used to describe what was happening, and that is that Daniel was so distinguished among the people. There, there was a way that he was distinguished. As I was thinking about that word, the, the thing that came to mind uh, was a passage of scripture that we looked at actually at the, back in August in our series on the presence of God. Uh, the very first week we looked at Exodus 33. It's a passage of scripture that I, that I feel that God draws me back to regularly. And I was, I was kind of thinking about why. And I think it's because that what is voiced there in Exodus 33 is something that you see play itself out in many different stories and people's lives and circumstances throughout scripture. What happens in Exodus 33 is that the people of God uh, are, are told by God that they can finally go into the promised land. That the promised land is, is theirs for the taking, but that he will not be going with them. That he's going to send an angel ahead of them, make a way for them. They can have homes, they can settle down, but that God wasn't, wasn't going to go with them. Well, the response of Moses, who was the leader of the people of God at that time, was this. God, do not send us up from this place without your presence without you going with us. For what else will distinguish us from all the other peoples on the face of the earth if you do not go with us? So again, we have this word distinguish here. That there's something about the presence of God the nearness of God as, as a New Testament believer, we would say the spirit of God that resides within us that distinguishes us. It's not our ability, it's not our good looks, it's not our skill set, it is the spirit of God. And, and that's what we see in Exodus 33. They had already gone into the promised land and said, these guys are, they're warriors, they're bigger than us, we don't have what it takes to overcome them. And God said, no, it's gonna be, it's gonna be me. It's gonna be uh, me going before you. It's gonna be, my spirit that distinguishes you, that sets you apart. Moses recognized this, that, that it's not, it can't be on me, God. It can't be on me to, to lead these people. It's got to be you. You're, the, you're always the one that's been the difference. You're always the one that's made the way. We don't want to go anywhere apart from you. And so we see this um, being displayed in the life of Daniel, that he is distinguished by the Spirit of God. It says that he is so distinguished uh, among the other, uh, the other leaders by his exceptional qualities. The, the more specific translation or direct translation would be excellent spirit. 
So th there was a spirit on Daniel of excellence. There was a, a set apart spirit, kind of like a, a holy spirit, right? There was this spirit that set him apart uh, for, for excellence. And uh, the, it was the first and foremost, what, what I believe that we can learn from the life of Daniel is that it was the spirit of God on him. Now that doesn't mean there wasn't good things that Daniel did. That doesn't mean that he wasn't good at things, that he didn't bring a skill set to the table that God used to bless others around him. That that's certainly true for Daniel as well as for any one of us in this room that we bring who we are we're not trying to be somebody else we're trying to be, walk in the spirit of God and bring who we are and the skills that we have uh, however much we feel like we have or however little we have we bring them to God and say God here's who I am here's what I have to give and, and God breathes on that and by his spirit he, he uses you and I for his glory and so it's about presenting ourselves to God. It's about Daniel uh, being faithful in the midst of a fallen world saying, God, I'm yours. God, I, I'm gonna stand for you. We've seen it over and over again. I'm gonna speak for you. I'm gonna live a life of prayer in you. And, and what we ultimately see is him being a man who is distinguished by God. And the king sees it and the king loves it. I mean, all these guys, the satraps and these administrators specifically uh, hold the satraps accountable so that the king might not suffer loss. So Daniel's job is, is to build up the king, to make the king look good, to make sure that his holdings are secure. That, that's, that's his job in, in this administration. And, and Daniel has proven himself so much so that the king wants to put him over the whole kingdom. He's got great favor in the eyes of the king. So that's awesome. Awesome, right? That God would distinguish us, that we have favor. We love that part. But there's another part. There's this group of satraps, as well as the other two administrators that are coming against Daniel. They, they despise Daniel. He might have found favor in the king's eyes and the kings love him, but there's a whole other group of people here who despise him and what he represents, who he is, the, the fact that he is in their path, uh, the ladder they're wanting to climb. Uh, they might think he's proud, arrogant. They despise him, despise his God, his faith, his people, and they want him out, okay? It reminds me of a, a passage of scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians, this letter that the apostle Paul wrote to the church in, in Corinth. And, and he describes this thing this thing of distinguishing it with some different language. He says it like this in verses 15 and 16. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. So this idea of, of distinguishing is, is now spoken of as an aroma that your, your life ought to smell like something that ought to have a smell to it, that when, when people walk by you and you walk by, there's something like, oh, I, I noticed something. I'm, I'm, there's a smell on that person that distinguishes them. Now it's one smell, it's the same smell, but it will hit people in a couple of different ways. Okay, it's not that you are to change one way or another. You just carry this aroma of Christ. Your life is distinguished because of what God's done in you and the transformation that's happened in your heart. And so your life ought to smell like something, carry an aroma. To some, it is an aroma and a fragrance of life. To some, it is a stench of death. It hits people in, in, in a couple of different ways. Um, there was a time... In, uh, at the Antioch in Boston before we planted this church where uh, we took a mission trip to, to New York City just for a handful of days. And there's a group of people that were going to do outreach. What we would often do is set up little prayer tables and people would have little aprons say, do you need, need prayer? And, uh, uh, and so you can imagine that going out to the, a, a New York City block corner, you're gonna have some interesting conversations with people and there were plenty of those to be had. But there was one particular moment when there, uh, a woman had come up and uh, someone had a prophetic word of her that just touched her heart. She ended up getting just uh, um, touched by God. She was on her knees. She was weeping. There was a few people praying over her. And so she's just kneeling there feeling seen by God, loved by God. Well, not two feet from her, just like a, a step over, there was a man who was irate, yelling all kind of obscenities at the team of people there offering to pray for people. Same fragrance, 
Same thing happening, but for one, it was, it was the fragrance of life. God sees me, he knows me, he loves me. And to the other, it was the stench of death. How dare you? How you dare you judge me or sit there like you have everything together and offer a prayer for me and, and, and I, I hate and despise everything about what you're doing. There is a reality in the life of the kingdom. There is a reality in the life of the one who chooses to live by faith, to, to be distinguished by God, to carry an aroma that to some, it will be the fragrance of life. And you'll get to have those incredible, beautiful moments where you're praying over somebody or getting to share a testimony and they're being encouraged and their spirits being lifted because of what you're sharing. And there'll be moments when people are, are despising you for who you are and your faith and calling you judge mental or, or bigoted or whatever it else it might be we don't like that so much we'd, ra we'd rather stay over here but what we see in, in the Christian faith is that there is an aroma that we are to carry there is a way that God would long to distinguish us by his spirit that would cause people to respond in one of two ways and it ought not to catch us off guard these guys were, were so um so desirous of moving Daniel out of the way and getting, getting him demoted or dis extinguished that, uh, that they began to try to dig up dirt on him. And, and they, they literally went to, to look and examine his, the, the way he conducted the governmental affairs of Babylon and, and tried to kind of develop this smear campaign, which we're getting plenty of, right? In the mail and on the TV. I don't know, it's, they're, they're getting so bad, I gotta like turn them off before my kid sees the, anyway, it's like, so this is what they're doing. They're like, we're, we're gonna dig up all the dirt we can to get this guy out of here, all right? And, and so the, the problem is they could find no dirt there, there, was, there was nothing there that they, they could find. It, it's, it says this, that they, they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. All right? And, and so we, what, we, what we hear is that, first of all, he's trustworthy. And that, that's pretty obvious that the king would want to put this guy in charge of the whole land, this guy who's been charged to... to, to uh, beware that the king might not suffer loss and he's done his job well and with excellence he's like I'm gonna put this guy over everything he is completely trustworthy and what we further find is that there is no corruption in him there there is no things that he is doing like taking money on the side or doing anything for selfish gain or cutting corners or uh, not following through with what he said he's going to do he's he's doing all of that not only is there no corruption uh, but there's no negligence so he is doing it all the way there's nothing half-hearted there's nothing that he said he's going to do that he's not doing in fact it may be found that he's going above and beyond what he said he was going to do there's a spirit of excellence on him and so we couldn't find any corruption well we'll find some negligence some places where he's falling short we can't even find that so ultimately they decide if we're going to find anything against this guy it's going to have to uh, be in the matters of, of his relationship with his God and so I want us to take just a, a moment here and I want us to think about tomorrow morning as we enter back into our workplaces, as we think about entering back into our schools and interacting uh, with, with, with coworkers, with neighbors, with classmates, and, uh, and to just think about uh, someone trying to dig up dirt on you, right? That wouldn't be fun, first of all. Uh, but what would they find? It's just a, a place of soberness, a place of taking inventory. You know, I know corruption is a pretty harsh word. Uh, so, so maybe you don't have to think about it in terms of like, oh man, is there corruption in my, my, my life and the affairs of my life? And so maybe that feels a little extreme, but, but really to think about are there ways that I, I cut corners? Maybe originally I didn't, but everybody at work cuts those corners, you know. Everybody at school kind of takes that shortcut or he kind of gets around the, the, uh, the, the policy in that way. So so. so you know, it doesn't really hurt anything. Uh, are, there, are there ways that, that we have made those kind of decisions along the way? Are, are there, uh, you know, things that we've done and maybe this hits you even more in a place of negligence where it's like, well, I've been kind of half-hearted. I haven't really given my all. I don't know if somebody would say, oh, there's a exceptional qualities, a spirit of excellence on this person. You know, I don't know, have I, have I really operated in, in that way and not for my own namesake, but because I represent someone else. 
uh, because I, I represent a king. My, my life is distinguished. Hopefully it has an aroma. And so do people look at my life and does the, the aroma of my, the, the, the actions of my life match the aroma of my life? Because that's where God really gets glory is, is where, where those things match up. And so it, it's right for us at times just like, hey, God, search my heart. I, I, love, I love that psalm. I love taking that opportunity in different places because I was even talking about it with our prayer team this morning. Just like I think one of my, as I was sharing with them some of the things I'm praying heading into the morning, I was just, I found myself sharing with them. I'm, I'm praying for just um, a fresh openness for, for every one of us to be convicted by God. Because sometimes we're, we're walking with God long enough and we're just kind of, we, we, know, we, know, we know the drill. You know, we know uh, like, okay, this is how we walk, this is what we do, this is how we, we live. And, and we, we forget to just live in that place of tenderness and sensitivity to the spirit, uh, openness to like, God, bring any place of conviction. Because in, and in that place, realizing as we all do, we haven't arrived, we don't have it all figured out, but there are places of growth, there are places of maturity that God would wanna take us to. And I, and I think that's what God's really wanting to do in us throughout this series. There's a lot of things that are coming up in the story today that actually come up, came up in week one, week two of this series, that it, it seems to me that God just wanted to drill down in the place of conviction around how we respond to our culture and how we uh, li live out the, the values of the kingdom kingdom. One of the ways that we, we see Jesus challenge us to do it that I think is very relevant to the story of Daniel uh, is in the, sermon, in the sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus is preaching the sermon to a crowd of people. And, and specifically uh, in Matthew 5 verses 13 through 16, he has another word, uh, another couple of words for this idea of being distinguished, having an aroma. He calls it this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it may be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. All right? And, and so this is, this is what Jesus calls it, salt and light. He doesn't even say, hey, I need you to go be salt and light. He just says, this is, you are salt, you are light. That, that's what you are if you're a follower of Christ. That, that's, that, that's what happens when there's the transformation uh, by, by the spirit of God and the grace of God through salvation in Jesus. You become salt and light. And, and so what, what we have in, in salt is uh, that it's important for the proper dispersion of salt. Right, you don't want a you don't want a, a food that's supposed to have salt to not have salt. It's too bland. You also don't want a, a, an overly concentrated uh, food with salt, or it's like you, you want to spit it out because it's so salty. It needs to be spread out evenly. That we're and I think a sense here is that we're we're as a, as followers of Christ meant to be out in the world, not to be isolated, not to be. Um, in one location, pulling back or reserving so that we, 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 so, that, so that we don't assimilate into the world's ways. But rather, as we see Daniel, he lives in the world while not assimilating to the ways of the world. Okay, And that's what we looked at uh, really, really a, a great detail in week one of this series, um, specifically looking at Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 29, where the prophet Jeremiah writes a letter to these exiles uh, telling them to go into the, go into the city, uh, you know, plant vineyards, buy homes, have children, pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city. This is what, what the, the word of the Lord is for the exiles. And so that's what we see Daniel doing and engaging in that way. For salt, um, not only was it used for flavor, but actually in, in this period of time, it would have been even more so uh, used for preservation of food. Without refrigeration, salt was used to preserve food for longer so that it didn't spoil 
or rot. In fact, that's where its value was really found. It wouldn't have been used for flavoring near as much as for preserving the life of food. And so in the same way, uh, the, the saltiness that, that we're to carry as followers of Jesus is, to, is meant for the preservation of that which he loves, the preservation of people and, and, and society that we would be the, the salt in that way believing for the love of Christ to be made known and for, the, for life to be preserved, for truth to be preserved. And to do that, we we're to go out, to, be, uh, to engage uh, a culture. In fact, that's where we, we really see God moving in the book of Daniel is where he was willing to in, engage culture, but not assimilate to the ways, to stand for truth. And it's in that place where there's an engagement w- without the, the assimilation uh, that, that set the stage for God to move in a powerful way. Or he was there in the midst of it, engaging, but not willing to look like the world. And it was in that place that God showed up. And the God had to show up where Daniel needed him to show up time and time again. And so that's the call for us to be salt and to be light in darkness, to, to show up and to be a consistent place of light. I, I'm, I'm really amazed at Daniel's response to, um, to hearing about the edict of the king. As we read in verse 10, it said that when Daniel learned of the decree, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Daniel had been living in a place of darkness as a light. That's not easy. It's not, it's not an easy, easy thing to do. You, you stand out. You, you, uh, you, 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 people will come against you. Again, th- this aroma thing, there are some people that will be drawn to the light. I've been waiting for the light and how I can finally see. There will other be people that like, get that light out of my face, right? I, it, it, you're hurting my eyes. Get as far away from me as possible. I like what I'm doing in the dark over here. And so there's, there's responses to that that Daniel's always navigating, not, not only as being a, a light, but being a, a, a lead, in a leadership position and, and carrying a light. There, there are all these types of things that we're reading about in this story. But, but finally here, um, we, we, he, he hears of the edict and he's like, God, I'm just trying to be a light here, right? I, there, there's several things that could happen. He could get mad at God. Really? Again, God? Why, why, are, we, why are we doing this again? Why, why, why are you stirring up people against me? He could get mad at those people that are, that are, that are stirring things up against him. Like, what have I ever done to you? What have I, you know, like we're, 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 a, we're, we're coworkers. What are you, what are you doing? Why are you trying to, to get me killed here? Uh, he could get mad at the king, like for, cause that's a boneheaded move. What are you thinking? Like everybody's gonna pray to you for, for 30 days. Why? And, and there, there's many things that he could do in, in, in his response. Many things that we would do in response. But what does he do? He hears about it. He does what he always does. And he goes to his room. He continues to pray three times a day getting his eyes fixed on the Lord and he gives, thank, he gives thanks to God and he trusts God. He's not actually caught off guard. There's something that he understood about being distinguished, about being an aroma. That's gonna mean some people are gonna be for you. There's gonna be a favor of God that you experience and there's some that are gonna be against you and he wasn't really caught off guard by it. Jesus tells us similarly not to be caught off guard. He says this in, um, in the book of John, chapter 15, beginning in verse 19, he says, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, then they will obey 
yours also. So Jesus is trying to take the shock factor out of it, saying like, hey, there's going to be trouble. You know, it says it again in John 16, 33. Uh, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Here he's saying, hey, they persecuted me. Are they not gonna persecute you? It's, it's part of walking by faith. So, so don't get caught off guard when the, the world uh, despises you and or the message that you carry. It ought not to, to catch us off guard. In, in that way, Jesus is trying to pre- prepare us to be unoffendable. The, the world may be offended by, by who you are. In fact, in many ways, the world ought to be offended by who you are. There ought to be a misunderstanding because there is not an understanding of the gospel. Uh, at, at times, there, there may be uh, that, that, we would, that, that a believer would be called uh, hypocritical or, or bigoted or something like that because there's not an understanding of the gospel. They hear, I, I'm saved, I am valuable, I am loved, I am approved of by God. I, I, you know, I have a righteousness in, in God that he, he, he sees me, he loves me, and knows me, and that can come across as arrogant. That can come because there's not an understanding of the gospel that he did all of that. I did nothing. I was miserable. I was a, a, a wretch, you know, that, that, you know, you have all the old hymns, but he, he saved me. And that's the story of the gospel, right? But that, that's, the, that's the glory of God as, as we tell the story of his saving of us. And, uh, and, and it's beautiful, but it doesn't always fully come out that way. And so uh, we're, we're also not saying I'm perfect and to do all things right. And so uh, uh, it can look like a hypocritical life, but I'm just saying, no, I'm, I'm flawed, but I'm, I'm, I wanna look more like him every day by, because of his mercy, I'm, I'm still moving forward, not because I, I'm not flawed. You know, th- and so there, there is this, there can be a misunderstanding. And so we gotta, we, we, we have to have a, a level of maturity to understand and to be okay with being misunderstood, to understand that there is, there's something about the gospel that is offensive. It, Jesus is, it says is, is, the, is, a, is a stone that causes people to stumble because it's, you can't, you, we can't understand it with our, our, our human thinking. And, and so there's got to be a place for us here before we go there on Monday morning, say, I'm gonna be, I, I can be unoffendable. I don't, I don't have to, just like, just like Daniel didn't take up arms, he didn't get militant with all these guys. There wasn't a big showdown. I mean, because that could have been his response. Like, satraps, you're messing with the wrong guy. Do you not know that the king is about to put me over the entire land? I, I, do you not know I've got people loyal to me as well? You, you, wrong move. And I'm coming after you and you're, you're, you are going down. You thought I was going down, you're going down. And so th- this, could have been, this could have been the move of Daniel. But what did he do? He said, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to go to my room. I'm going to pray. I'm going to give thanks to him. And I'm going to wait on him to move. In this way, Daniel was a light. He, he, he didn't move into places of, of darkness to get his way. He stayed operating in, in the light, having an un, unoffendable spirit, being okay, being uh, accused falsely or misunderstood. Um, and because in the end, rejection, um, uh, hurt uh, from, from walking out the, the life of faith is, is really unavoidable. I think, and sometimes we try to we try to avoid it, but it, it's inevitable if you're going to walk in the light. That to some it's going to be it's going to turn off, and to some it's going to attract. And so we're we're always wanting to evaluate our our life at at one level to say like, okay, uh, am am I causing am I causing people to be turned off uh, from from Jesus because of um, well, let me, let me say it this way. We can get into a couple of places where we're, try, we're overcompensating for like, oh, I wanna accept, I wanna love. Maybe we're not being offendable enough, you know, or we're not being offensive enough in that way. Uh, and maybe in that, it's like, okay, I need to be salt. I don't need to be isolated. I don't need to, I need to be, be, be salt and light. Uh, other times, maybe we're, we're not being attractive enough, you know, where it's like, uh, hey, 
that, that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm causing people to turn away from Jesus, not allowing Jesus to be the stumbling block. And so we don't wanna be the stumbling block. We wanna allow him to do so. And so we see Daniel navigating this uh, in a way that I believe we're called to emulate. Let me finish reading the story uh, as we begin to close, uh, picking up in, in verse 16 and reading through verse 23. So Darius had tried to find any way to get out of this because he wanted to save the life of Daniel. But ultimately it says this, that the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you have served continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. And the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted God. At this point in time, I don't know what you're picturing in your mind uh, as, you, as the story is read, but Daniel is about 80 years old. And um, so he's been through a lot. At the beginning of this series, he was a teenager, so we've come a long ways in just six weeks. But in the first week, we, we really commended uh, the, the youth of the church. Like, hey, the, the youthfulness, like, hey, be believe. Like, you could do great things for God. Don't let anybody just look down upon you as, as, in your youth. Uh, now can I commend those in the older generation that are closer to Daniel's age of 80 where he is still living out a life of faithfulness. You know, he, he was, you know, man, at 80, it's like, man, I want to be retired. I don't want to be facing the lions anymore. Like, I want to be done with that, kind of on, on cruise control. But the, no, he was like, I, I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it for the kingdom. I, I, I'm, I'm in it for the call of God. I, I am, I am a, a being an example for the generation to follow of what it looks like to trust him and to follow him, to be salt and light and aroma uh, for Christ in, in a broken world. Uh, and that was the way he lived. That was the, the example that he gave. How, how did he do it? And um, as I was thinking about it, I, I was thinking about his life and, and those, you know, this, the 60 years that he lived that, that he lived up to this point in Babylon, he had seen three kings come and go. <coughs> right? He'd seen power come upon a, a man and then be taken away overnight. He'd seen the rise and fall of governments. And what did he do when he heard about another ploy uh, to take him out? He went and he opened his window. And he looked at the king of all kings. He looked at the one that he will talk about in, a, in Daniel 9, whose kingdom and dominion knows no end. It knows no rise and fall, but it is consistent and it will never end. He goes to look at that king. And I think about how we're, we're also challenged in Colossians 2 to do the same thing. <coughs> Excuse me says this, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. See, we're challenged to do the same thing in the midst of the troubles that we face. Then to keep our, not, not get caught up in the noise of this world and the arguments and the shouting, but actually to say, hey, there is another king. The kingdoms of this earth, they, they rise and they fall. The, the powers that be, they come and they go, but there is one who has stood the test of time. And it's that king 
in that kingdom of which I am a citizen. And so what does it look like for me to stand for the truth of that king in that kingdom? What does it look like for me to, to stand firm in, in, in the place of, of, his, of his truth and his justice with a heart attitude of compassion and love that he carried? What does that look like? And I think that's what, what God's wanting to drill down in us. What does that look like for me to live that out every day in the world that I live in? among the people that God has given me influence, because the beautiful thing about salt is that it's not just the one little grain of salt maybe that I represent, but we're all salt. And so we get poured out over the city, over different communities and neighborhoods where we all have the opportunity to bring the, the love of Christ and the, the flavoring of relationship with Him and the preservation of life that only He can give. And so it's right for us to examine our, Jesus called us salt and light. Is it true of me? What is the aroma of my life? And so we see Daniel trusting God and now here he is in the lion's den. And what we learn about the, the lion's den and what we know from other biblical references is that it's judgment. The lion, the mouth of the lion, the lion's den are often referenced in, in scripture as judgment or even the judgment of God. And, and so here, here he is and he is in, in the lion's den facing judgment facing the judgment of his accusers. And once again, just like we did a few weeks ago when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the, the fiery furnace, somebody shows up. And most people believe it's the same person, that it's the, the pre-incarnate Jesus. It's, a, it's Jesus showing up in the fire, not an angel, but the angel, his angel, uh, that shows up here in the lion's den. Again, we find God choosing to save and deliver, but not in the way of preventing uh, the, the catastrophe from happening, uh, but actually showing up in the midst of it. And, and it was, as Daniel said, he who shut the mouth of the lions. And so when I, I think sometimes we misinterpret the message of this story, even from our childhood, we're like, oh, if we're like Daniel and we're good and we're moral and we stand up for God, then nothing ever bad will happen to us. But that's not the story of scripture. That's not the story of the gospel. That's not the message of Christ. And that's not the moral of the story of Daniel. The, 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 what we see in the lion's den is a picture of the one who brings salvation so that we can come out without, uh, without wound. It says that Daniel came out of the lion's den and he was not wounded at all. Well, we have one who entered the lion's den with him. We have one that has entered the lion's den with us, the ultimate lion's den is the judgment and wrath of God against our sin and rebellion. The perfect, the perfect justice of God that would, that would destroy us because of our sin and rebellion. And yet there was one who entered in, who came in against the, the mouths of the lion uh, on our behalf uh, so that we would not face judgment. And he was more innocent, more pure than Daniel. He was falsely accused for crimes that he had not committed. And he stood in that place and he closed the mouth of the lion. He closed the mouth of the lions. The difference with him and Daniel is that he didn't come out unscathed. And, and, and that's because he's not Daniel, we, we're Daniel. And we come out unscathed, but he still bears the marks and the wounds of the sacrifice that he made. And it's this beautiful story of the gospel that we see way back in Daniel. And it gives us courage today to know that if God has stood in the ultimate lion's den and, and closed the mouth of the lion so that we could ha come out unscathed and that we can live with God forever, will he not also enter in with us in every uh, small lion's den that we face in the face of our accusers or those that come against us or that, that, that despise us? Is it not true that God in that same way can we not trust him that he will be with us in the den, shutting the mouths of the lions that will give us a place of courage and faith to live the way he would call us to live, to live in that place where we are engaging with society 
and we are, we are loving and we are sacrificing. There's no corruption. There's no animosity. There's actually a maturity to, uh, to be able to withstand being misunderstood, to, being, uh, to be able to be despised and yet not carry offense, to live in that level of maturity, engaging with culture, yet not compromising and assimilating into culture and providing this crossroads and this intersection of engagement and, 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 but not assimilation where God shows up. Where, where we're truly salt dispersed in the world. We're truly light in darkness and God shows up and he shows off in that place, drawing people to himself because that's, that's, that's his desire. And that's what, he's, that's what he says. And uh, as he calls us the, the salt and the light is that we would be this light and that our good deeds would be on display for the world to see. He actually says this in that same Sermon on the Mount, right before he calls us salt and light, you know what he says? In the two preceding verses, he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth you are the light of the world. And so I'm praying today that there will be a grace for us to walk in that place, to be who God has called us to be today because our world needs it today. They need us to be salt, need us to be light, need us to, to have the, 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 a loving engagement where, where as Daniel was believing for the best for the king, that we're believing the best for them believing that they would uh, be won over for the sake of Christ, being won over by the light of the gospel and the love of God while walking in the truth of what he's called us to walk in. So Lord, we're asking for that grace today. We need that grace. We need that grace, God, in, in, uh, in what feels like unprecedented times, in what feels like uh, uh, so many uh, uh, landmines around our, our faith and what we believe and things that could cause angst or anguish or anger. Lord, I, I'm praying that, that, that those things would come out in peace and in faith, uh, in, in um, believing for, for righteousness and justice with compassion and love that are motivated by you. Giving forgiveness as we've been forgiven, Lord, that, that we would truly be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Jesus, we, we first learned that you are the light of the world. And then you call us the light of the world. So would you, would you light us on fire? That we would, we would be ablaze, that just a, a bright, brilliant, shining light for your glory, God. We, we wanna display who you are. We, we want people to see you for who you are. We don't want them to see us. We don't want them to see our ideals. We don't want them to see our understanding of this, that, or the other. We want them to see you. I was stirred this morning as we were, were singing the song where it says, we join with all of heaven to declare these things. It's like, Lord, that's what we wanna do through the way that we live. We wanna join with all of the heaven declaring who you are. Lord, let people see Jesus in us. Let them see your love, let them see your truth, let them see your mercy, let them see your compassion, let them see your justice in us, Jesus. Would you distinguish us, God, for what else sets us apart other than your presence? Lord, don't send us from this building today without your presence, for what else will distinguish us from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? Be glorified in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? And we're just going to take a, a time to, to respond to the Lord. Just a, the closing minutes that we have together. We want to respond to him, to what he's doing. We want to respond to places of conviction. And so I want to first just want to invite our ministry team. If you're on our ministry team, would you come on up here to the front? And, and if you have 
need of prayer for anything, whether it has to do with something we talked about today or not, uh, you can come and receive prayer from one of the members of our ministry team. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, we'd love to just enter in as the church. We, we believe that God answers prayer and that we're not meant to carry our burdens alone, but that we, and so we wanna get in your boat and pray with you. Uh, uh, others of you may be hearing about just the, the, the light of Jesus today and the love of God who rescues us from, from the, the pits of life. And you may be drawn to that. If that's you today and you wanna know about how to have a relationship with God, you can have that today. And we'd love to just share with you about his love for you and, and how you can begin that relationship today. And finally, the front is just open as always. If you just need to come and get on your knees, on your face before God and say, God, here I am. I wanna be an aroma. I wanna be salt and light. Uh, Lord, would you help me? I need a fresh grace today. Or I have, I'm feeling convicted today. Would you, I, I just wanna repent and come into a, a fresh place of walking with you. You do that, but let's not one of us leave this place today without responding to God.